All right, so we are <clears throat> deep into um, notes number nine, the PDF, laterally heterogeneous Kirchhoff migration, by which I mean uh, PSDM, pre-stack depth migration, which I've only done in, in two dimensions, but which is, in fact, regularly practiced now in uh, several industries in three dimensions, um, four dimensions even, you know, tracking um, uh, CO2 injection for uh, um, carbon uh, capture and um, se carbon sequestration and all that. It's all been done. And what I want to remind you about is uh, this picture here, where you see the migration result showing the reflection from the unexpectedly shallowly east dipping I'm sorry, unexpectedly shallowly south dipping east branch of the Garlock Fault in Cantil Valley, uh, as covered by uh, Cocorp uh, Mojave Line 5. And um, that migrated image is, is on the back of a um, uh, velocity section. Uh, again, 2D, and it's a crude velocity section because it's uh, estimated from uh, a, <coughs> a priori uh, information uh, and then forward modeled to match the, um, to match the, uh, the traces in, uh, in some ways. I'll show you that next. Uh, but not really an, an inverted velocity model. <coughs> but it's what was necessary in the case of uh, this um, survey to just get a start with um, pre-stack depth migration. And uh, it certainly does have some, some significant lateral velocity contrasts, velocity changes by a factor of two between the uh, um, Sierran, uh, no, between the uh, RAN schist uh, to the south of the basin and uh, the deeper sediments within the basin, probably uh, tertiary Volcanics uh, intermixed with uh, volcanic clastic sediments, as uh, probably similar to what we have here in uh, uh, northern and central Nevada. Um, although this is a little bit further from the some of the main tertiary volcanic centers, and then um, uh, across the uh, um, the east branch uh, with its uh, shallow dip that I'm hypothesizing here, um, there's some very significant vo lateral velocity contrast as well. And all of that is affecting the ray paths of the waves and, and how we uh, can kind of untie all the diffractions and bow ties in the, in the reflections and, and uh, properly locate this reflection uh, on the reflector, on the velocity contrast at this uh, surprisingly low 45 degree dip. So here's a data volume uh, rendered in 3D that has the synthetics. Again, the negative amplitudes in the seismograms are rendered as uh, completely transparent, just a little bit of uh, cloudiness as you look back into the volume. The positive amplitudes, the uh, mildly positive amplitudes are translucent objects, and the um, and the strong, um, strongly positive amplitudes are the um, opaque objects. So what we can do with a volume like this, uh, as you can see, quite complicated enough, even though it's just a synthetic, there are multiple reflections in here. There are uh, diffractions, uh, you know, sidewall reflections from the uh, various branches of the fault. And this data volume, uh, this synthetic volume, gives us a nice way of figuring out what we're seeing in these complicated shot gathers. Uh, the shot gather is on the front right, and we have a zero offset gather, uh, zero offset section, uh, time section on the front left. Um, and in the shot gathers, you can see some of the strongest energy, especially in the synthetic, is dipping back, propagating back toward the source. 
Offset increases to the right across the shock gather. You can see the direct wave coming out here. It flattens out into uh, refractions that you can see. Um, and then uh, there's uh, uh, forward scattering, you know, wide angle reflections from this uh, east branch. Um, there are uh, uh, backscattering and, and diffractions from the uh, southwest branch at, at various uh, levels, where um, you can see these sort of corners where the southwest branch intersects, say, the RAN thrust, okay, which is a geologically very interesting intersection. Uh, the RAN thrust is a Mesozoic uh, thrust that has the subduction complex below and, and the um, Sierra and granite uh, above. Uh, actually, probably early Cenozoic, if I think about it a little bit more. <clears throat> Remember my Southern California geology a little better. So the way to tell, uh, at least my favorite way, what's what, is to look at the zero offset section. So we can see um, several things. We can see the flat basin bottom that's giving us a strong zero offset reflection. This has got to be the east branch because it's coming right up to uh, just past the end of the survey at uh, VP or, or flag number or station number uh, 382. Station numbers are increasing from south to north. So uh, this data set starts with, a, with a, uh, the, the modeled vibrator sources at to station 333, which is uh, south of the basin. Um, on top of the uh, the ran thrust and the sear and granite, a uh, little bit of alluvium there, um, and then proceeds um, north to um, um, to three eighty two to um, three eighty two, and then the offsets actually point back to the south. Okay, so the, with the source at three eighty two, looking here at the uh, at the uh, zero offset section. Um, this shot gather represents sources, I mean, represents receivers going back to the south. Okay, um, and actually, it should, should uh, for ten kilometers offset, it should go back one hundred stations. So it goes back further than uh, we're looking here. <clears throat> uh, back to uh, station uh, um, three um, or two eighty two. All right. So, looking at the uh, um, at the East Branch uh, reflection, you can see that that it's kind of a uh, oblique plane <coughs> um, that uh, is coming out as a uh, uh, you know it's very close to the surface uh, at this shot, and uh, you know we're shooting down dip, shooting uh, with increasing offset to the south in this direction. And so uh, it's a very uh, uh, sharp hyperbola, and it's just behind the first arrival, okay, and continues. Uh, in fact, we can see it refracting through the uh, southwest branch, okay, and we can uh, uh, connect that. You know, if we uh, were to rotate the volume around, which I can't do anymore because uh, I don't have the same hardware, we would see it connecting. Uh, uh, back to here. Okay, uh, the flat basin bottom. All right, we can see that uh, here, and you can see it's a you know pretty normal normal move out reflection in the shot gather, and uh, because it's flat, it doesn't matter if it's uh, in shot gather or column midpoint gather or what. <coughs> And um, it's uh, asymptotic to the uh, um, at least parts of the first arrival, the low, low velocity parts of the first arrival. Then there's this uh, diffraction that's coming off the uh, the intersection of the basin bottom with the the southwest branch, and uh, so that's uh, um, probably here. Okay, so that corner. You know, is a, it's generating a pretty strong diffraction when you're shooting from within the basin, and uh, you can connect that down to here. Okay, 
So we can see that these back reflections, you know, where the wave is propagating back towards the uh, the source to the north, those are um, those are coming from the southwest branch. And what we're trying to get accurately, of course, is the ge geometric relationship between the flat basin bottom and the east branch reflection. We really want to get that east branch reflection in and also be able to collapse some of these uh, diffractions and back reflections. Um, I know back reflection as a term is kind of redundant, but when we're also talking about forward scattering, we have to be a little more careful in, our, in what we say. Now here's how the um, how these uh, uh, synthetic shot gathers match the data shot gathers, and I think I can increase the size uh, at least once here. So in the data, we're looking at a progression of records, um, and you can see that there's a, a basically a, a crossover in the in the first arrival. Uh, to a higher velocity, uh, you get out of the low velocity basin sediments and go to a higher velocity. It would lo what looks like a refraction crossover and partly is. Um, so that locates the uh, that crossover actually locates the um, the southwest branch. So here we're um, we're shooting from uh, 362, and then this one in the middle is shooting uh, from uh, a bit north. Um, uh, a little more than a kilometer north at 375, and then this is the mo northernmost shot point at uh, 382. And each of these, uh, you know, in each of these records, you can see that the the as they pull the spread to the north, the um, crossover point is progressing to the left, um, which means it's progressing to greater offset, even though it's staying in the physically the same place. So um, fairly decent, uh, you know. These all need uh, um, the velocity model certainly needs uh, correction. All these uh, slopes, all these crossover distances, uh, the times they're not they're not accurate enough. Uh, but what I was really focusing on was um, not so much getting the velocity model right as duplicating the uh, uh, the phenomena that I saw. Um, so uh, you know what's the relationship between some of these reflections that you can see here? Um, you know where is the uh, the east branch reflection? Um, some of these diffractions are very very strong, and uh, you know how can how can a sidewall reflection off off a fault be be the strongest thing in the record other than the first arrival? Well, the synthetics are are showing you know how that can be. Um, now these are just acoustic. You know this probably should be repeated with um, uh, elastic uh, modeling, but uh, I think the story would be basically the same, except uh, you know we get all the interference of the uh, Rayleigh waves. Uh, what happened to the Rayleigh waves in the data? Uh, you know they should be in a cone over here, and uh, they are there, um, but the CoCorp surveys used very long geophone groups. Um, over 100 meters long, and so they were able to cancel most of the Rayleigh waves um, just with their field practice, um, their field procedures. So that leads to the unfortunate um, uh, effect that we can't analyze the Rayleigh waves from any CoCorp surveys. Um, but uh, you know, if they hadn't used those large groups, it would be really hard to uh, Pull out uh, these little reflections here, which you can see are coming from um, structure within the or uh, stratigraphy within the basin and uh, um, and uh, uh, and the basin bottom. Uh, so um, this is what's in this uh, uh, Louis and Chin paper from uh, uh, I think it's uh, 1991 and. Um, I think this is the uh, probably uh, you know this early uh, demonstration of, of full wave modeling being able to uh, reproduce uh, some of the uh, some of the features some of the very 
at the time, unexpected and strange features of the data, I think that was really the only reason that, that this got published. Because otherwise, my uh, assertions about uh, what, what this data set is showing are completely unfounded. All right. Now, thinking about um, um, the problem of uh, uh, PSTM versus uh, PSDM, OK, contract that a little bit. Uh, this is uh, just as, as a little interlude here. Um, the result of PS, um, uh, PSTM. So I, I took a suite. I tried to make uh, velocity spectra, in essence, by doing pre-stack time migration th at constant velocity. And so uh, on the left face, the, the, this narrow left face of the cube here, you can see what uh, uh, maybe look like velocity spectra, you know, terminated on the left side. I should have uh, added a light on the left side so you could, it would look more like velocity spectra a bit. Um, so velocity increase, the, the, the migration, constant migration velocity increases from two to four kilometers per second in that direction. And then, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, my 492 class gets subjected to, it has to pick <coughs> A, um, um, uh, CV stacks, constant velocity stacks, you know, this would be uh, the process that I was trying to uh, put forward here <clears throat> is one of um, uh, constant velocity uh, uh, PSTM. Okay. And as we saw with uh, those uh, synthetic examples, the truncation model, the cavity model, um, done at you know uh, sort of uh, uh, an irrelevant scale. <clears throat> the um, the PS uh, um, the migration uh, um, the PSTM is able sometimes to distinguish the correct velocity uh, via the amplitude of the reflection that gets imaged. And if you remember from the uh, uh, the truncation example, uh, at the correct velocity, the amplitude of the reflector gets to a maximum. And then, you know, under most conditions, it, it maintains that maximum amplitude at velocities that are too high. So what we're looking at here is we're trying to migrate through velocities that are really correct, you know, just for the sediments, including in the basin in here. This is the location of the southwest branch and the east branch over here. And... Um, Again, uh, we're looking through a volume. This is this is not synthetic now. This is uh, a real data result, and you know I've really made transparent, or at least heavily translucent, uh, everything except the most strongly positive amplitudes, um, especially the uh, the negative amplitudes. Even if they are very strong, uh, I just wiped them out and made them transparent. So in this cloud, you can see these uh, reflections. That uh, you know, kind of appear at uh, some uh, velocity, not at the maximum I'm looking at here, and then maintain their uh, their amplitude and their their opacity there, thereby. Um, let's see. So the basement uh, actually, the um, the the bottom of the sediment south of the southwest branch, you know, outside the Garlock Fault Zone, is pretty uh, pretty shallow. And so that's, uh, these reflectors are probably associated with uh, the bottom of the alluvium, just a few hundred meters down. Uh, this is uh, certainly a reflector in the basement. I, I would say that's the, uh, that's the RAN thrust and the uh, schist down below. Maybe there are, uh, you know, random structures in the schist that are imaging here. Um, you know, the attribute of... Um, one attribute of PSTM that is, is still quite valuable is that even if you don't have the velocity right, you know, via the, that truncation and cavity model that I showed you, you still get something imaged. And it may be mislocated in depth and, and position, but the, the, it's, it's quite possible that the uh, geometry of it will be, will be about right. So the RAN thrust is thought to be mostly flat. The bottom of the basement is, is mostly flat. 
The thing that we're not getting is this east branch reflector. You can see it's kind of hinting that it, it should migrate more, you know, and, and, and maybe come up to steeper dip and meet the east branch here, um, which is what I, I predict it does. <clears throat> but um, you know, maybe it's it's I didn't try velocities at all high enough. Yeah. So are we looking at a semblance cube or is everything along the velocity slice? Just like a CV stack sum. It's a it's a CV stack sum. Okay, so it's but, a sum of real amplitudes. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah, sum of real amplitudes, and and only only the positive ones are left opaque. Everything else, you know, near zero amplitudes, actually fairly positive, but not very positive amplitudes are, are pretty so uh, transparent. Like some kind of scaling? Is it like a constant scaling or like discrete scaling? The, the, velocity, the velocity is is a linear scale. Oh, no, I mean uh, for what it decides to make transparent or opaque. Ooh, that was, yeah, that was very psychological. I, I played around with it a lot. So it's, uh, it's, uh, like, is it like a it's almost. Thing? Like when it crosses a certain amplitude threshold, you make it opaque? Uh, no, you can see there's lower amplitudes here that are that are mostly uh, sort of cloudy. Uh huh. Okay, and the and these um, um, these reflectors sort of emerge out of the smoke. So it could be linear, but I think it's not. I think I, you know, and then the way it's rendered is is perceptually much more complicated. You know, so you could make the you can make the opacity. It's it's possible. No, I think the opacity is highly nonlinear with amplitude, um, and then you know the opacity that you see, the sort of thickness of the cloud of smoke depends on the thickness of the volume you're looking through. Mm -hmm. um, like the sampling rate and everything. Too. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a it's a highly nonlinear thing, and I, you know, I played with it a lot to to make it look like this. This is one of the few examples I have of a three. Of a volumetric rendering of, of real data where you can see anything. Was this that hundred thousand dollar software you're talking about? Yeah, so it's a soft it was a hardware software combination called a Sun Tech 2 that I had here right after I moved here. Okay. So um, you know what we're what we're learning here is that. We can get some of the reflections with uh, with PSTM, but to really properly locate and and say anything more about this East Branch reflector, we've got to go all the way. We've got to we've got to use the best velocity model we have and all the information on lateral velocity variation that we have. And um, so here's how how we use it. Okay. So and, and uh, this is uh, very similar to what you guys are doing. With your um, with your projects, um, so let's take uh, let's let's take one out of this data set. Let's take one trace. Okay, it's going to have a source at three eighty two and a receiver at three hundred. All right. So um, let me go back up to the three D data volume. Let's see. Maybe that's uh, in here. Um, yeah. So it's like this data, this uh, data thing on this data shot gather on the right. All right. It's got its source at three eighty two, and a receiver at three hundred. So you know, let's say we're trying to get that trace right there. Okay. And in the acoustic synthetic, it's this trace here. And on the uh, on the volume, you know, it's uh, about this trace on the front front right, right here. Okay, so we're going to bring that trace into the program. We're going to try to migrate it. Sorry about all the scrolling. Okay, now what information do we need to uh, to migrate that whole trace? Um, so hold on, John. That's a common receiver gather, and that's a shot record. What what we um, what we're looking at here are time sections. Okay, so this um, 
there's a velocity model. There's this uh, same velocity model. Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm not going to scroll up yeah, to those it. Those are travel time contours. That's right. Yeah, That's but, right. But what are we? At? We're looking at a common receiver gather on the left, and then a, a shot record on the right. No, these are these are uh, these are the same. Um, all of these are are renderings of exactly the same section. You can see they have the same. Um, the same uh, range of VP numbers, the same range of, of surface location or flag numbers at the top, 300 to 400. So they're shot records and you're moving the source, yeah, not the receiver, right? No, no, these are not, these are, these are, uh, these are cross sections in, uh, these are not records at all. They're cross sections with X on the, across the top uh -huh. and depth Z down. I think what's confusing is on the top left says receiver at VP three hundred, but you mean source. This was a typo, right? No, no, receiver at not at all, not at all. Okay, so so first, all right. Let's look at the one on the upper right. Okay, so that trace that I just showed you where it is. Okay, that's um, the vibrator uh, for that for that trace. The vibrator was at. Flag number VP number three eighty two. Yeah, and I I'm pretty sure that in this survey there was a uh, um, there was a, a pin flag in the ground with uh, three eighty two the number three eighty two written on it. Okay, and that was over here. Okay, so we have a velocity model, and uh, you know it's got a it's got a base a low velocity basin in here, and otherwise sort of gradually increasing velocity. So we put the 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 and, and these are uh, the Dolly deterministic travel times cast through this model. Okay. And I think this one I didn't have to smooth at all. It, it, it worked somehow. Um, and, um, uh, and so we have, uh, uh, you know, the Vidali uh, for, for the source at 382, this location over here on the surface. Then the the Vidali travel time code, um, you know, with just one um, square root operation per uh, per pixel on on here, um, which I think is about a hundred, uh, uh, either fifty or hundred meters. So there's not all that many pixels. Okay, the Vidali travel time code gives us the travel time from that source through that model to every point in the in the section. Okay, so uh, and then I take that travel time, and I calculate its uh, remainder when divided by uh, 0.5. Okay, and render that in uh, in view map, and um, so uh, you know at zero travel time you see white, and then as the travel time increases toward 0.5 seconds, um, it gets dark, and then right where it flips to white again. Is at 0.5 seconds. Okay, so it's that's what we're what I'm emulating here is a contour, a travel time contour at 0.5 seconds, and then here's the next 0.5 seconds. So it's a contour at one second, 1.5, two seconds, 2.5. Okay, so this uh, you know if when the source went off here, if this model is correct, then these these travel time contours would be the wave fronts as well. They'd be the P wave fronts. Now, of course, this travel time really doesn't say much at all about what the amplitude of that wave would be you know, along that wave front. And you can see uh, you know, the velocity is much lower at the surface, right? So we have a head wave you know, tilted uh, here. And uh, it's got this sort of complex uh, Wavefront structure, but it's so there's this break in the wavefront, and it's kind of healing by by here. Okay, so that's half of what we that's half of the um, uh, imaging condition that we need for uh, uh, PSDM, right? This gives us you know for every possible reflection point in this section, this gives us the time from this source. We're just talking about that one trace now, okay? The one trace that results from having the source at 
at uh, flag number 382 and the receiver at flag 300. And for now, we can get the uh, uh, the time from the source to the reflector. Uh, you know, this is T sub s um, for everywhere in this section. Okay. Now I'm going to put the the travel time source at the receiver point on the surface. The receiver for this trace was at flag 300. Okay. And uh, so I've got the same model and the same position at the top, right? I'm just putting the source at the receiver point. So I am invoking seismic reciprocity. And when reciprocity has problems, it's mostly problems with amplitude, not problems with time or velocity. So it's a good bet that this would work. Okay. So uh, uh, the receiver at uh, VP300, okay, I, I need to get T sub G, right? And I get T sub G by taking reciprocity and casting a travel time from, an, let's call it, a, uh, a reciprocal source at VP300, okay, which happens to be the upper left corner of the, of the section. And likewise, you see half second, one second, you see the refraction. Okay, and the, the refraction is starting to get delayed here in the basin. Right, you can see it's uh, we lose the sear and granite there, and and it's starting to bend back a lot, and then we have this forty-five degree uh, dipping um, east branch of the Garlock Fault, which is a strong refractor. And look at that; there's a a uh, horizontal uh, travel time contour, which means that the wave is propagating straight up. Okay, so we're uh, just like the example I showed you from from. Uh, Dixie Valley early on, this, uh, um, this arrival is going to be simultaneous, um, that uh, refraction. And the data have a little bit of that. <clears throat> OK. Now, um, so according to um, the imaging condition, we need to for for each reflection each possible reflection point in the model for this trace then we can see where the reflections are coming from if we add um, t sub s which is on the upper right to c t sub g which is on the upper left and that sum for each point in the model is down at the bottom <clears throat> okay so um, um, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, as the uh, as the sum. Okay, this ought to be um, the contours in this, which again are sampled at uh, uh, half second intervals. The contours in this view ought to be um, um, the uh, ellipsoids of revolution in this section. Okay, um, and the uh, uh, the the foci of the ellipses should be um, the receiver point and the source point. Okay, there's the source point. There's the receiver point. <clears throat> and you know, for the, the larger travel times, when we're in the basement where you know velocities are fairly uniformly high, you can see that that it does indeed look like ellipses, okay, with the foci at uh, 382 and 300. Um, now, um, so, uh, uh, and this is a realization that Satish and I had uh, many years ago. You take a, uh, and maybe it came out of this plot, actually. You take a, a, a source travel time and a receiver travel time section, you add them together, and you find the minimum time somewhere. Okay? Internet's probably acting up again. 
So the minimum time. <coughs> Okay. So, uh, yeah, probably, uh, probably blame it on uh, UNR, uh, UNR uh, Wi-Fi. Okay. Well, we can't let that stop us. So um, here's the uh, here's the source point. Here's the receiver point. Between those, if you trace trace out where the minimum time is, it's all the same. It's about two point eight seconds. And you could find it along a path. Okay, you could find that minimum time along a path. Uh, that would be the um, the ray path. You know, so if we if we came uh, th through the uh, uh, receiver travel time, and uh, and we traced a ray, you know, like let's say we came down these. Uh, we came down these contours, uh, uh, and we came. You know, we come down uh, the ray path, always perpendicular to the travel time contour. Okay, so let's say we came down the these travel time contours, and we we're tracing to 382. Okay, right here from 300. All right. So the refraction path, the direct, you know, the most direct path, the minimum time path, um, is actually going to take us through. Um, you know, down here, through the basin, or maybe under the bottom of the basin, and that's exactly what this travel time sum section is showing us. Okay, you follow that minimum path, that minimum time. Okay, about three point eight seconds, and you're going to undershoot the basin here, which is exactly what you'd expect. You know, for a minimum time path, uh, where the um, where the uh, the basin is, um, um, you're shooting almost to the other side of the basin. Uh, now you might be able to see. I can almost see it on the screen that there's kind of a bifurcation. Um, so this uh, uh, this is a way of actually using the Dolly's travel time code, or any any such deterministic travel time code, as a ray tracer. Right, you can uh, you can follow the ray. Now maybe here, I, I think I see a little dark spot right in the middle there. That means the minimum time ray might go down below, or might go above the dark spot. And you know most ray tracers cannot handle that. They have to make a decision one way or the other. But when you um, when you sum the Vidali times this way, you get it. You can even see bifurcating rays. So uh, uh, Satish used this in his thesis actually to um, to calculate uh, uh, to trace rays in in ways that uh, nobody had thought possible before. Uh, so you know, right out of uh, right out of these ideas for um, pre-stack depth migration, we're also getting ideas for ray tracing and tomography. Okay, so we'll we'll leave that till later, but I just want to make sure you understand uh, what happens when you get the sum travel time. Okay, so so the travel time is actually increasing as you can see. You know these these uh, these gradients go from from white to black. You know with increasing travel time. So we have about two point eight seconds minimum travel time all along the ray path here. Okay, and then. You know, as we go up into the basin, there's more travel time, and as we go further in the basin, more travel time. So if you're looking for uh, reflections in the basin from this particular trace, right, which is, you know, has this the source and receiver at the edge and well outside the basin, right, you would be looking for times larger than three seconds. Okay, in here. Um, but this is what we Okay, so we uh, we're at this. Uh, uh, let's say we're looping through uh, you know all locations in this in this section, and um, we've got this trace loaded up uh, from um, receiver at at VP three hundred and source at VP three eighty two, and um, 
we, we're in, a, in our looping through uh, the whole section. We're, say, right there. Okay. We go uh, into the travel time sum section, and we pick up, uh, we pick up the, uh, the total travel time, which looks like here would be uh, maybe 3.3 uh, .3 seconds. Okay. And then, then we go 3.3 .3 seconds into the trace and look for that. Uh, uh, so let's do that. Hmm. Where's the time? There's the time scale. Yeah, 3.3 .3 seconds into the trace, and uh, and look for uh, um, pick up the amplitude there and plop it into our migrated section. Okay, and you can see there is some amplitude there, and there's some interesting uh, reflectors too. So our uh, if if I was to uh, do that just for that one trace. You know, I would see the trace sort of swept out along these arcs and along these uh, these surfaces of, of equal travel time, equal total travel time. Can you include the obliquity factor in there? Uh, no, no, because uh, you know, what is the validity of the obliquity factor if I'm trying to image a uh, a, a steeply dipping structure? And the ray really is hitting it, you know, broadside, not broadside, hitting it sidewall. Well, you know, that's when I asked last time how the amplitude's handled. I thought you said it was built in the obliquity factor, but it sounds like here you're just spreading it around. Yeah, for this one, for this one, I didn't implement the obliquity factor at all because I didn't want to, you know, what the obliquity factor does, it dip filters, it biases the result towards flat structure. So I didn't want to do that. So here you just take that exact value and you spread it. That's right. Along that spread it along the 3.3 um, second, you know, so it, it, it gets spread out in here and all through there. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the migration of one trace looks like this travel time sum plot very, uh, very distinctly. So if you were doing, say, you know, layer cake geology, you might want to put in the obliquity factor, but for this kind of thing, probably for Santa Media, you wouldn't want to do that. That's right. That's right. Because it could be from a vertical. And structure. you can you can set it to uh, to zero, and then for a lot of the um, the three D migration I've done, I'm looking for flat structure like the uh, the flat to, uh, well twenty degree maximum twenty degree dipping Hikarangi uh, uh, subduction interface, and and for that I might even square the obliquity factor. You know, I'll, I'll cheat as much as necessary to uh, to get an image that that the geologist can understand. So you could even choose kind of an engineered factor, I guess, just to pull out twenty degree dips. Or... Absolutely, absolutely, you can. Huh. Um, and there's a way. Uh, one of my um, colleagues, um, and I'll think of his name later. He um, and we're going to learn more about uh, slant stacks even uh, a little bit more. Uh, <clears throat> he put the he, he basically takes a slant stack of the sh of the shock gathers and then applies migration and so he uh, um, he can emphasize uh, either you know waves arriving in a cer certain direction or he can also through the operator he can he can emphasize waves that uh, are originating on structure of certain dip. Um, so he migrates a slant stack or he filters? yeah yeah yeah. You can use a slant stack to do essentially dip filtering. But I mean, he slant stacks, filters, and inverse slant stacks, then migrates, right? Not just. No, he slant stacks and then migrates the slant stack traces. <laughs> it all ends up being the same thing, right? Remember, remember, right. migration. Migration is is a linear process, so it doesn't matter whether you're migrating, you know, the early time and the late time, the uh, short offset, the long offset. You know, you migrate pieces of the data and you add them together. It's the same thing as migrating the whole data. So what he's doing is he's he's migrating uh, a certain piece with a certain range of p, with a certain range of slowness, and uh, you know via the slant stack. Um, so and it's it, it's it's all linear, so it's all fair. Yeah, I guess so. He does rate, he does travel time calculations through the. In the P-tau domain? Yeah, Mil Milkerite. Uh, huh. His initial publications are in the 80s on this, and 
he's uh, carried it through even to more recent times. Okay. So he did some very interesting work uh, getting, uh, you know, dipping, um, dipping reflectors in the Canadian uh, cratonic crust. I think he's still in uh, Toronto. Okay, <clears throat> so so uh, all right. For every single trace, then we need to have you know we need to have a uh, a source time section and a receiver time section. And so here's an example of the travel time volume that uh, you know for this problem. The tr this here's the a rendering of the travel time volume that uh, I. Um, uh, I use to migrate the the whole thing. Okay, so um, uh, on the front is is a travel time section. It's all the same section. Okay, we're just putting the the travel time source, you know, between um, um, uh, between uh, VP two hundred and you know I should really relabel this VP two hundred and VP uh, three uh, three hundred actually. I think this goes all the way to 300. And uh, this purple uh, object, the outside of it is half a second. Um, the outside of, uh, of the uh, cyan, um, there's probably some fancy uh, decorator's name for that color. I don't know what it is. That's uh, one second, one and a half second contour in yellow, two second contour in orange. You can see here, the here's that, that a little uh, shelf. That's the uh, the flat um, um, the flat travel time contour. That's uh, the refraction coming straight up, climbing up the ramp. Um, so uh, you know, source uh, at the front at uh, two hundred, at the back at three hundred, and then tracing through the uh, uh, the travel times through the volume. So this is the kind of, of volume that that you all have to generate, okay? And I was saying I was checking the validity of these travel times by looking at this rendering. I mean, you'll do it in a much in a simpler way, but I, I don't know if if one of you guys figures out how to bring these travel time volumes into Open Detect and and check it out very easily and cleanly. More power to you. <clears throat> I haven't been able to do this sort of visualization in many years. You can do it in MATLAB. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. MATLAB can handle it, but I don't use MATLAB, so I'm I'm at a disadvantage there. Have to admit. Okay. So let's compare. Uh, let's let's you know we've got we certainly have exactly the model that we that we use to generate the synthetics. Okay. So we can make some comparisons. Um, so um, we've seen before the uh, the migrated stack. This is a uh, um, this is a, a, a stack section that's uh, that's then migrated at a constant velocity, just uh, um, stolt migrated. Okay, there's the east branch reflection. There's the flat bottom of the basin. Um, here's uh, uh, here's uh, the uh, stolt migrated zero offset section, which you can see is really what we're after. You can see the southwest branch here. And maybe that's the diffraction there at the uh, the Rand thrust. Um, here's a, uh, a, a the synthetic migrated at the same 2.4 kilometers per second basin velocity, the low basin velocity, uh, but for the um, but using uh, constant velocity uh, PSTM. Okay, and here's uh, here's some examples of. Uh, uh, and this is this also I think was important in uh, to include in the paper. Um, D here is migrating the, the synthetics with the correct velocity model. Okay, so this is as good as we can get the east branch reflection. You can see there's some kind of artifact projecting uh, down from it, from the intersection. There's uh, the migration of the flat one. Um, we're not migrating very well. The uh, the southwest branch it's uh, too steep. Um, a lot of multiples and other things, uh, you know, that that have these uncontrolled uh, obliquity factors. You know, there's a there's a uh, basically the smile. You know, we're seeing this uh, deep crustal um, reflector here, and 
its smile because there's no there's no source of the receivers at the very right edge of the model to constrain that. Um, here's some trials where I took the synthetic data set and said, all right, what would happen if I had data from, you know, as I do, that includes this dipping east branch, but I use the wrong velocity model, okay? And here's what sh the, the wrong things that happened there and, and how I could tell. So I think that's why uh, the reviewers found uh, the case convincing enough that, uh, you know, by, by getting the, the reflection on the, uh, uh, on the velocity contrast, uh, I was close enough with my lateral, laterally varying velocity model. Okay. Still, you know, as a synthetic show, really poor imaging of the southwest branch. I'd like to do that much better. Um, but uh, we're getting that unexpectedly shallow dipping east branch. Um, OK, I think uh, there's just another example here uh, from early work with, uh, uh, this is from uh, Bill Hodges's, uh, um, Bill Hodges's uh, master's thesis from, uh, this is probably 1993 uh, that he graduated. Um, there's a number of Rice University surveys, uh, and I kind of got in trouble for using them. So, you know, it's important to engage your colleagues in the correct way. Um, and uh, a couple of them cross this uh, Hosbury fault. Um, and uh, that's a very controversial fault because uh, just over here somewhere is the um, uh, Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant which uh, Pacific Gas and Electric is going to try to relicense. And if they are, uh, you know, if the Hosbury fault is a, is a shallow dipping thrust fault, then, uh, you know, that plant needs uh, some pretty incredible uh, uh, reinforcement. And uh, they're going to have to spend a lot of money. So here's, uh, you know, uh, Bill and Satish worked on this together. Um, they optimize velocities from um, hundreds and hundreds of, you know, by tens of thousands of uh, first arrival time picks on the RU3 line. Um, they optimize the velocities. The Hosbury fault is in here somewhere. You can see there is velocity contrast. Uh, and the, uh, the standard deviation, uh, we'll discuss what that means, uh, is uh, not any higher there than anywhere else. And then two uh, results. Um, this is uh, kind of a standard PSTM, right? And there's a lot of diffractions that are, uh, you know, unresolved here. Um, and we do the PSDM through the, uh, uh, the laterally variable uh, velocity model, and we can see these uh, steeply dipping fault traces coming out, okay? And some uh, antithetic uh, faulting that uh, uh, led us to the uh, suspicion that, that perhaps... Um, the, uh, uh, the thrust uh, is coming a little bit steeper toward the surface. And uh, whether it's buried down here in the, uh, in the noise. So here, here you can see the typical artifacts of uh, PSDM, right? These are, um, um, these are the, uh, um, the uh, uh, ellipsoids, ellipsoids of revolution, right? Right there. Here's some more you can probably see, uh, even on the screen you can see them. Um, and, and typically what I do now is uh, I'd say, well, you know, I believe the flat stratigraphy, but I don't believe these, uh, these artifacts, so I'm going to apply an obliquity factor, um, and uh, that's not one, and, uh, and, and mute that, do some dip filtering. But then, of course, I'm also muting the, the structure that I want. So... Um, you know, I have to. I have to live with that. Uh, um, I have to live with that. And uh, a lot of the work that's been done on PSDM lately is in, um, you know, how to get control of these artifacts because the the geologists just hate to see those artifacts cutting through there. Uh, so, you know, so what do you do? You use uh, judicious muting. You use control over, uh, uh, you know, varying uh, control over uh, the um, um, over the dips uh, using Milkerite's uh, methods. Um, you, you, you strive for more accurate velocity models. 
Um, there's all kinds of things that, that you can do. Um, you know, of course, we're geophysicists and we're exploration geophysicists, so you know, we might even outline this area and uh, pass a, uh, uh, a dip filter over everything except the structure that we're looking for. So, um, um, you know, the geologists you work with may complain about geophysicists, uh, you know, pulling tricks on them uh, like that before. Um, and, uh, but uh, uh, it's easy for me, you know, knowing, you know, seeing the, uh, uh, the sum travel time uh, vol uh, sections like I, I have looked at a lot, you know, it's easy for me to identify the artifacts and separate them from the, uh, the real reflections, but uh, you've got to train your geologist to uh, recognize them similarly. Okay, uh, and I better get out of here. <laughs>